Okay. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, I'm gonna try to give you a few um, like background results that might be of uh, might be useful in actually understanding the the main seminar um, because I may not have as much time to dwell on them uh, when I start that. Uh, so there are sort of three preliminaries that I have in mind. Um, so the first is the, uh, the this protocol which kind of inspired this work. Uh, it's due to Toby, Toby Cubit and others uh, in 2010. Uh, the second thing is this, um, this hypergraph uh, invariant that I want to maybe tell you about a little bit which will show up uh, somewhere towards the end of the talk. And then the third theme is this uh, Speckens uh, contextuality, which may or may not be of um, uh, interest, uh, depending on whether you're, um, oh, wait. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm Ravi Kunjwal from the, from the, the, the Université Libre de Bruxelles, so like the, the French speaking for University of Brussels. <laughs> I apologize for that, speaking <laughs> to mo uh, mostly Dutch audience, probably. <laughs> um, okay, so, um, yeah, so, um, and so, so these are the sort of three things that I want to uh, get through, hopefully. Um, okay. Okay, so the, the basic setup is going to be um, a two-party sort of communication uh, problem. So you have uh, Alice who uh, wants to send some message M to um, Bob and Bob has to sort of guess this uh, message M prime, but M prime has to be equal to M for Bob to guess the message correctly. And this message is uh, picked from uh, an alphabet of uh, size Q, for example. And they're given access to some uh, classical channel between them. So this channel has inputs X and outputs Y. And so the uh, and and the in, in the protocol they're allowed access to shared entanglement. Um, uh, okay, and 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 they want to be able to use the shared entanglement to sort of improve how well they can communicate using this this classical channel. Okay. Um, so, so for the classical channel itself, I mean, I guess maybe most people here are familiar with it. It's just uh, a, a map, a stochastic map from uh, the input alphabet to the out output alphabet, um, um, where you know, for every input alphabet, there's a set of al al output alphabet. Uh, for every letter from the input alphabet, there's a set of letters in the output alphabet that can occur with uh, a non-zero probability and the sum over those guys should be um, uh, equal to one for every X. So this is just like the basic definition. And, um, and we call two symbols confusable, two, um, uh, in, two input symbols confusable in the channel if they overlap essentially like their, their, their supports, like the, the outputs they can lead to, um, they, uh, ten, they have an intersection, okay? So, um, so given output y here, uh, uh, you cannot say for sure whether um, it was input x or input x prime. So in that sense, they are confusable. Um, so here, for example, are a, a few simple uh, instances of, of, of classical channels. So here, um, so for example, you have a four input um, a classical channel which has six possible outputs. So, so the representation is such that uh, every hyper edge uh, denotes uh, an output, so a letter in the output alphabet, and every vertex denotes a letter in the input alphabet. Okay, so there are four uh, inputs here and uh, six possible outputs. Okay, so this is like a completely connected kind of uh, situation. Um, and here, every pair of vertices is con confusable. Uh, that is, um, uh, they always have some overlapping uh, support for every, every pair, okay? Some common output. Um, here's another example. 
where um, you can have, um, uh, again, you have four um, uh, letters in the input alphabet. And um, um, for outputs, now in this case, you can identify pairs which are not confusable. So for example, 0, 0 and 1, 1 are not confusable because they don't share an output. Similarly, these two are not confusable because they don't share an output. All the other pairs on the other hand are confusable just as in this case. So these are just two examples of, uh, of, of classical channels. Uh, note that these two channels are of the form where uh, essentially if you were to write the confusability graph of the channel, so this thing is the confusability graph, it's basically the same as the, the channel hypergraph. So I call this thing the channel hypergraph um, and the, the orthogonality graph of this is the, is the uh, confusability graph. So when I say orthogonality graph, I mean you connect every pair of vertices that appear in a common uh, hyper edge, okay, in your graph. Um, to see that these things can be different um, is, for example, you can look at this channel hypergraph where you have, again, four input alphabets, sorry, four letters in the input alphabet and um, um, three possible outputs, two and three. Um, now, if you were to construct the, the confusability graph for this, it's basically this, which is the same as like the confusability graph of this guy. So, um, you know, you can have different channel hypergraphs corresponding to the same confusability graph. So obviously this carries more information and we're gonna use this to uh, represent um, the channel. Um, and um, so whenever I say alpha of gn, I mean the independence number of the, of the graph and the independence number is like the size of like the largest non-confusable set. So for example, here it's just one, like you cannot have every other uh, vertex is confusable with uh, a given vertex. Um, okay. And the, the, the quantity that um, is of interest in, um, in the original paper on which, which kind of inspires uh, the main talk um, is the one shot uh, zero error capacity of, of the classical channel that the parties share. And now that is basically the, the maximum number of messages that Alice can send through the channel with uh, zero error. <coughs> and uh, um, this happens to be the same as the independence number. So as I said, it's the size of the maximum sort of like, you know, the non-confusable um, set in the, in the in the channel, um, I hope this is clear. If there's any questions, please ask. Um, okay. Okay. So if the problem setup is clear, then we are going to look at the same problem now for a specific channel. Um, and in this case, uh, it's this complicated-looking channel. Um, and uh, so, so this is the channel that Alice and Bob share and they want to send messages through this channel, okay? Uh, the first question to ask is what is the one shot uh, zero error capacity of the channel? And uh, that turns out to be five. So they can send um, at most five messages um, uh, without incurring um, uh, an error. So, so to see that uh, you can notice that um, so it's, it's a simple coloring sort of situation. So for every, um, uh, so for example, I, I, if, if I were to pick um, um, like the, so, so this is, an, so the, the vertices in red here form an example of like a, 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 a non-confusable uh, set. And if the, and the largest such set is of size five here. Um, now the, the interesting thing here uh, and the key to sort of this, this work that I'm sort of reviewing right now is the fact that this channel hypergraph, namely this guy, admits a, a quotient specker set, okay? Uh, so when I say a quotient specker set, um, 
I mean a set of vectors on, on some Hilbert space. In this case, it's a four dimensional Hilbert space such that you can associate a vector to each of these vertices. And um, the, the vectors in each hyper edge form a, a complete orthonormal basis. So, so this is a basis on in four dimensions, for example. Okay. And, um, and it has this special property that this, this, this channel hypergraph uh, or this auth, uh, the, the hypergraph representing the, 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 the quotient spectral set in this case um, is um, uh, uncolorable in the sense of um, uh, quotient spectral uncolorable, namely that um, if I, um, I, I cannot, I cannot assign, so you can think of it in terms of assigning one and zero uh, probabilities to, to this uh, hypergraph, such that every hyper edge is normalized. So that means if I assign a one here, sorry, if I assign a one here, then I have to put a zero everywhere else here, zeros here, zeros here. So, you know, in every basis in which this vector appears, you have to assign zero to the other elements of that basis. Um, and so when you try to do this coloring, you will see that it's, it's, it's impossible to color it in, in such a way, okay? So you cannot assign um, uh, deterministic outcomes to these measurements. There's 24 of them. So there's 24 hyper edges here. Um, uh, yeah, so, so you cannot assign them. That's the quotient spectral theorem, okay? Um, and and this, this work essentially uses the quotient spectral theorem to show that you can increase uh, the one shot zero error capacity uh, of this particular channel, uh, precisely because it admits a quotient specker set to um, uh, uh, six messages. Okay, so um, yeah, I want this to be equal to six messages. And, and the message encoding that, that they choose um, is of this type. Uh, where you know these are the 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 six uh, messages that Alice wants to send to Bob, and um, for every message, there's a measurement Alice can do on her system. So now they share like a, a bipartite sort of state, which like you know Alice has um, uh, one part of it, like a four-level system, and Bob has another part, like another four-level system. Okay, and they're kind of entangled in the in, in the protocol. They're maximally entangled. Okay, um, now Alice can do one of these six measurements on her part of the uh, quantum state she holds, and um, depending on the outcome, so which is labeled by these X's, like the input alphabets and input input letters of the the channel, uh, she inputs like one of these guys to the channel, and um, now for every input that Alice makes, Bob can observe like one of three possible outputs because every input appears in three um, bases, okay? Um, or three hyper edges. Um, and, and um, okay, I'm getting ahead of myself right now, but for now, just note that these, these, this, this is Alice's encoding, okay? Um, let me go through the protocol more formally. So firstly, they share a maximally entangled state of two four-level systems. Um, Alice encodes the six messages in, in six disjoint bases here, um, like these guys, okay? To send uh, the message M, Alice performs uh, the measurement uh, in basis M to obtain the outcome X, which is fed to N. This is what I was trying to say earlier. Okay, so, every, so let's say Alice wants to send this message. She makes this measurement. And she sees one of these four possible outcomes, and uh, whatever she sees, she inputs to the channel. Okay. And um, on receiving uh, Y, so so Bob can receive one of these three guys for uh, his uh, output if the input was this. Um, and and this occurs with probability, the channel probabilities. Then Bob proceeds with uh, to measure in the basis y and obtain uh, his outcome. So, so if this was sent, then 
um, Bob is going to, um, well, let's say Bob observed, um, oh, sorry, the output corresponding to this um, y. And um, then Bob decides to measure in this, in this basis, basically, okay? Uh, on his part of the quantum system. And uh, Bob will obtain the outcome x prime. So the, so the x outcome x prime from this measurement that Bob is going to see is going to be exactly equal to the input that Alice fed into the, the classical channel. And that's the key, basically. That happens because you know whenever Alice sees um, outcome um, uh, x, so that corresponds to you know one of the the four vectors in that basis M. Um, she steers uh, Bob's system to to the corresponding state um, with with that probability of, of of seeing like this outcome. And um, and whenever Bob uh, measures in the basis y, which contains x, then he's obviously going to get the outcome x with probability one because that's the the, the state he's holding um, in, in, in that run, um, okay? Um, so is, is that clear, like how the protocol works, like how, how the enhancement of the, the number of messages happens? Because this is like the simple summary of, of, of what happens in, um, in this paper, like the first paper here, okay? Um, if it's clear, then um, maybe the second element that I want to briefly mention um, is this sort of invariant, which maybe I won't have enough time to talk about in, in, in the main seminar, uh, but which appears in, in, in the results. Uh, so I just want to define what that invariant is. Um, the way you compute it, so, 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 okay, it's kind of a weighted kind of thing because so you associate some weights, some probabilities with the edges of the hypergraph. So with each of these, like there's some probability associated with them. Okay, so there's 24 edges here. Um, uh, right, so that 24 includes these guys as well, which are not originally part of the channel, they're, they're part of the encoding. But, but these are additional orthogonality relations that the associated measurements have. So, um, so the way you compute this quantity is um, you look at the set of um, probabilities you can assign uh, to this. So instead of like zero one value probability, you look at like um, arbitrary probabilities. So, um, so you, can, you, you can assign whatever you want here uh, with the constraint that with every for every hyper edge, the probabilities must add up to one. So that will define some sort of a polytope on, on, uh, of probabilistic assignments on, on, on this guy. And um, um, this is an optimization over, over that uh, polytope of uh, probabilistic assignments. And it just says that, uh, so, so, so this is a point in that polytope. This is a set of probability assignments to the vertices here. Um, so for every such probability assignment, um, you uh, take the weighted um, max uh, predictability of um, the measurements um, or, or the hyper edges in, in the hypergraph, okay? So for example, um, let's say the, these, this was like uniform probabilities, okay? So one over 24 or something. And then you ask yourself for every uh, edge, or hyper edge, what's the uh, assigned by this probabilistic model in within that hyper edge, okay? And so this gives you uh, some sort of, uh, I call this the weighted max predictability. It's, it's about like how predictable can you really make each measurement um, in this hypergraph um, if you allow arbitrary probabilistic models, which just have to satisfy normalization and positivity, okay? And we know that this quantity, um, you know, uh, when, so for example, when this is one over 24, it has non-trivial support on all the hyper edges. It has to be less than one, strictly less than one. And we know that because 
we cannot color this thing. Like, as I said, like, you know, the, you, you cannot consistently assign ones and zeros to this hypergraph. So, which means that, you know, you, you cannot color all the bases, like you cannot, uh, uh, yeah. So, so you cannot have a predictability of one, basically weighted max predictability of one for an uncolorable hypergraph, which underlies a quotient specker set. So that's the key thing here. Um, in the particular example, like where we have this encoding, um, uh, this, this encoding, um, you consider for example, where your weights uh, on the hyper edges are only on, on these M's, like these six guys, and you ignore the other 18, okay? Because they're basically repartitionings of the same uh, set of vectors. Um, then you compute the same quantity. And uh, this again, uh, as in the general case, uh, we know that this should be strictly less than one because, of, because there's a quotient speckle theorem there, okay? Um, so this was like just a definition of, of, of this hypergraph uh, invariant. Now a concrete example of this is, uh, for example, so here's a simplified version. Can I ask Sorry? some clarification? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Um, you have a weight on the edges, and you also are evaluating probabilities on the nodes. Are yes. these two completely independent? Yes, yes. So, so this is not. Oh, well, okay. So, so this has to be non-zero for. Um, uh, this has to be zero uh, outside. So this is normalized, right? For every every hyper edge, that's the only constraint. It, it cannot depend any in any other way on the uh, on the hyper edge. But this probability is uh, defined independent of. Yes, it's it's non-contextual, like in the sense that if I assign a probability here, it doesn't depend on whether it's this basis, this basis, or this basis. So that is implicit in the fact that I represent it by a by a single vertex. Hmm. So that's the. It's kind of left. Uh, yeah, it's I kind of it's it's here that constraint. That the probability assignment is non-contextual uh, is another way to say it that it doesn't depend on the context in which your vector appears. So there are two probabilities both represented by the same symbol. That's what's yes. confusing. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. So so that's also the key here because the thing is, it's like the same vector that appears in three different measurements, which are three different bases. So think of like if you think of it quantum mechanically. It's like, you know, the probability you assign to a projector is insensitive to which measurement basis it appears in. Like the bond rule doesn't care about the, 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 the basis in which your projector appears. It's just a function of the vector itself, right? So that's kind of an example of a probability rule where uh, this, this condition is satisfied. But here I'm not, for example, uh, asking for only quantum assignments to these guys, I'm asking what are like the most general set of probabilities you can assign to these guys such that these assignments are non-contextual. They do not depend on the bases. Okay. Okay. Does that help? A little bit. That's, that's why we have this constraint. For example, if, if this could depend on the context, then I could always assign deterministic outcomes. Like, you know, because uh, basically I'm free to assign um, one to this for this basis and zero to this for this basis like they're like i could have done that if if i conditioned it on the on on the basis but you do not do that that's where the quotient specker theorem comes from um okay if if that helps then um maybe i should probably start the seminar itself soon um yeah uh, just uh, shall we meet for like uh two more minutes usually people join in at this time sure sure so i mean i have like one more page of the pre-seminar okay, yeah, so can. if, if yeah. you want to still so this is just to give you a concrete example okay of um so here i've kind of simplified the previous uh hypergraph so instead of like i've thrown out some of these uh hyper edges okay and i'm just i'm restricting myself to just nine uh, oh fuck sorry oh i apologize um um yeah. So um, yeah. So you can you can restrict yourself to um, to just these nine hyper edges, and you still have that uncolorability property. Namely, you cannot assign ones and zeros to these guys. Um, uh, and this is basically the famous. Uh, it's 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 the four vector, like the the four level proof of the quotient specker theorem that's due to Cabello and others. 
Um, and and this, this basically comes out of like these, this set of 24 rays that Perez had originally sort of constructed. Okay, so, so in this hypergraph, for example, if you ask for the polytope of assignments, the, this as an, so the, the, these numbers in blue are, uh, form an example of uh, an extremal uh, assignment, like a vertex of that polytope. And it's the one that maximizes, for example, this, this beta quantity that I was talking about. So in this case, um, so this is an example of computing that quantity. So, so here, for example, we're assuming that the weights on the bases, like there are nine bases, is one over nine. And for each basis, we look at the max probability. And here we can see that, you know, six um, of the nine bases have like uh, deterministic assignments. So you have six deterministic assignments and three of them here um, have um, assignments max probability of half. So that's this thing. And so you can show that uh, if you optimize over actually all the uh, uh, probabilistic assignments to the hypergraph, the maximum value this thing can reach is five over six, okay? Now, why is this quantity interesting? It happens to be interesting because it, it plays a role in, in, in writing down a robust version of, uh, robust, a noise robust version of, of, of the quotient speckle theorem in the sense that um, if, for example, you did not have exact projectors, but you had some POVM elements which had these relations, okay? Now they should be just read as like a resolution of the identity rather than uh, an orthonormal kind of resolution, okay? Uh, in that situation, can you still kind of say something about uh, what sort of contextuality is going on? So in that framework of, of um, what I'll call Speckens contextuality or noise robust contextuality, um, there's this quantity that you can compute, which basically captures how well you can, um, um, how predictable you can make each of the measurements that appear in your quotient specker set with respect to uh, some, uh, with respect to uh, input states. So for example, if these are like ideal measurements, so there's a projector associated with uh, each vertex. If, uh, so for this projector, I know that if I prepare the, the corresponding eigenstate, I get this with, outcome, with probability one. Similarly, for this one, I know that if I prepare the corresponding eigenstate, I get this with probability one. So that's true for each of these because they are projectors, okay? On the other hand, if these were POVM elements where the, the uh, largest eigenvalue would be less than one, um, then it cannot be made perfectly predictable. You can make it as predictable as possible, but, but not like perfectly predictable. So in that case, you know that uh, this sort of quantity, so this quantity is supposed to capture the average correlation you can achieve for each of these vectors if you're allowed to vary over the input states with respect to which um, uh, they're measured. And so in the ideal case, this quantity turns out to be one. And um, so this is like the quantum example because for every projector, there's a corresponding eigenstate that uh, makes it perfectly predictable. So for that reason, this happens to be one. But if you were to ask for a non-contextual model of, of this experiment in the sense of Speckens, then uh, this, this, this quantity will be bounded by beta. And this beta is strictly less than one. And we know that because of like the quotient Specker theorem. Uh, but now note that what we've done is uh, we have shown that there's a, there's a region between uh, five by six and one where you can still witness contextuality. So if you were, if you're, uh, this quantity core was slightly greater than five over six, you can still witness contextuality. You don't have to go all the way to one. So one is the limit where all your measurements are projected, okay, which is where the quotient spectral theorem applies. Um, so this is the sense in which it's noise robust. Like, so every time I say noise robust, I mean, there's, there's this gap between the, the bound here and like the, 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 the maximum, which is achieved by quantum theory. Um, okay, so, um, I'm ready to start the seminar whenever. And I can also take questions on this one. Okay, if there are no questions, maybe we can start. Yeah. Hi, everyone. This is uh, uh, welcome to the QSOF seminar today. And uh, our speaker today is Ravi Kunjwal. 
Uh, Ravi, can you also introduce yourself, like from which university you are? I'm a bit uh, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. I'm from the French-speaking Free University of Brussels. Let me put it that way. Uh, it's called the ULB, um, um, Université Libre de Bruxelles. Uh, pardon my French. Um, so yeah, I'm going to tell you about some work that I did with a summer student, Shiv. And um, uh, when he was visiting me at PI, I used to be a postdoc at PI, and he was a student and undergrad at Texas. Now I'm at ULB, and he's a PhD student at Duke. Um, this, this took a long time to finish this project. Um, and yeah, this project is about the role of contextuality in this uh, problem of entanglement-assisted uh, classical communication. Okay, so there are three um, uh, themes to this talk, and um, I will kind of try to introduce them one by one, and then try to talk about how they are they connect to each other. And so, so the first is, of course, uh, uh, this notion of contextuality, uh, which I've been calling for those who were in the pre-seminar. I've been calling it uh, noise robust. It's noise robust in the sense that you can make sense of this notion for. Um, POBMs and for um, mixed states. Um, there is this protocol for entanglement assisted one shot classical communication. Again, for those who were in the pre seminar, you would have um, seen how this protocol works, but I will introduce it again in the seminar itself. Um, and then the third theme is uh, uh, non local games, which I'm guessing is quite familiar to most of the people here. So I will probably spend less time on introducing that. Um, okay, so, so let me start with sort of trying to give you um, a feeling for what, what each of these notions um, are. Um, okay, so for contextuality, uh, you have this, um, uh, the basic setup is of an operational theory. By an operational theory, we mean uh, some sort of prepare measure. Uh, so the, the kinds of experiments we are interested in will be ones where You've prepared something and then you measure it. So you, you, you don't take into account. So there's no non-trivial evolution, time evolution between the preparation and the measurement stage. Okay. Uh, so it's a prepare measure experiment and you have a device which um, has some preparation settings uh, labeled by P. Um, and there's some outcome that this device registers uh, X every time a system is sent uh, to the measurement device which uh, uh, implements some measurement depending on the setting M and, uh, and records some outcome X prime, okay? Um, and the, the quantity of interest for us here is the, the probability of um, X, X, like the outcomes given the settings, okay? So X and X prime given P and M. So, so when I say an operational theory, I mean this bare probabilistic sort of uh, description of this experiment, just this data table, okay? Um, so, so far I've not kind of really invoked a lot of structure in the theory. I've just said it's, it's basically this collection of probabilities, okay? Um, and then of course you can think of more concrete operational theory. So if you think of quantum theory as an operational theory, uh, this would look like, you know, this preparation stage is like preparing uh, an ensemble of quantum states, uh, rho x given p, uh, with some probabilities. Um, and so every time you see x, uh, out classical outcome x, you know that the system was prepared in, in this state. And then that was sent to the measurement device, which implements some POVM. So these are POVM elements. Uh, labeled by X prime. And so if you see the outcome X prime, um, you know that this is the element that registered uh, the outcome. And so of course, the concrete probability rule is given by uh, the bond rule in quantum theory. And, and that looks like this. So um, uh, yeah, so, so this is just your POVM element. And, and this is the, the, the probability firstly with which you sample this state and then the state itself, right? So, so that's this. So this is just to give you an example of, 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 of what that, uh, this, thing, this thing looks like in the case of um, um, quantum theory, 
okay? But uh, of course, like the analysis is kind of uh, general, general in the sense that we will not make a lot of quantum assumptions and, and trying to prove um, our theorems. Um, okay, so the next thing that uh, we need to sort of uh, also keep in mind for the same experiment. So the first description of the experiment was operational in the sense that all I cared about was the inputs and outputs of like some boxes in the lab, right? Like I, I did not try to give it any more meaning than just the data, data table that um, you uh, register, you collect in your experiment. Now, uh, when we talk about an ontological model of the operational theory, you're essentially asking for um, an explanation of the operational statistics, which is this, in terms of properties of some intermediary, some, some so we'll call these ontic states in the sense that they're taken to be proxies for, you know, what are the real physical properties of the system. Um, and um, um, so, so this is very much in line with like how in, in, in Bell's theorem, like for example, these would be called like hidden variables, like local hidden variables in that particular case. But here we'll just call them ontic states. And, and so the causal account or like the, the, the explanation for why you see what you see here is that every time you kind of um, uh, implement this um, preparation procedure, um, you sample this lambda with some probability. Uh, so for example, um, you know, you, you, so firstly you see some outcome X and, and conditioned on both of these, the, the setting and the outcome, you sample lambda with some probability. And, um, and then uh, that lambda is sent to the measurement device. At the measurement device, uh, you implement some measurement setting and you record an outcome which, and the probability of this outcome depends not only on the setting, but also on the, on the lambda that is received by the device, okay? Uh, and, and then of course you coarse grain over these lambdas. So we don't have access to these lambdas. So this is like a hypothesis about a possible explanation for why we see what we see, okay? Um, so this is that. Uh, and note that right now I haven't imposed again any constraint on, on, on this thing. So, so it's in general always possible to write such a thing. Um, there's no no-go theorem right now, okay? Um, the no-go theorem comes about when, for example, you make some assumption on, on the ontological model relative to the operational theory. So the restriction on the ontological model that we will look at is uh, the non-contextuality of preparations and measurements. Um, and, and this will form a notion of classicality, okay? So when I say non-contextuality, it's the idea that if you see an operational equivalence uh, in your data in the lab, then the reason you see that operational equivalence is that um, it also holds um, at the level of the lambdas, at, at the level of the, the, the ontological description. So this is like the ontological equivalence. So more concretely, what this means is that, so, so consider all possible uh, measurement interventions you could do for uh, two possible preparation settings, so P1 and P2, okay? And we will course gain over the outcomes of P1 and outcomes of P2. Okay, so, so we are summing over Xs here. And when you course grain over the outcomes of P1 and outcomes of P2, you find that um, these probabilities are always agree. Namely that you cannot, uh, there's no measurement intervention that will distinguish them, okay? So that means that there's an operational equivalence between this way of implementing your uh, preparation versus this way of implementing your preparation, okay? So in the case of the, uh, you could take an example of a qubit, for example, where you can prepare, let's say the maximally mixed state by equally mixing, you know, Z spin up, Z spin down, or X spin up, X spin down, right? So those are two different preparation procedures for the same, uh, which are statistically equivalent. So, so in general, in an operational theory, when you see this sort of equivalence for, for two preparation settings, then uh, the assumption of preparation non-contextuality sort of dictates that because you cannot operationally distinguish these two things, there's no experiment that will distinguish these two settings, uh, you must, so this is the assumption, 
uh, at the level of the ontological model, assign the same um, distributions over ontic states with, with these two uh, preparation settings, okay? So this is an assumption, of course, like this direction is an assumption and this direction is a logical implication because if this is true, then uh, recall that here you will, uh, so I guess the easier way to see it is from here. If, um, uh, sorry, yeah, because we coarse grain over, over the X, so this term will disappear here. And um, for any two uh, P1 and P2, uh, if your distributions are the same, then the overall statistics will be the same. Okay, so that's just, just so that's that direction. Um, the non-trivial direction is this, this is the assumption we are making. We are trying to say that if, we, if I see an operational equivalence, if there's no experiment in the world I can do to distinguish these two preparation procedures, then that must be because in my ontological model, there's no distinction between what's going on with these two preparation settings. So that's the first assumption. We call it preparation non-contextuality. The second assumption is measurement non-contextuality, which is uh, similar in the sense that for all prior preparations that you could do in your prepare and measure experiment, there exist two uh, measurement settings and their respective outcomes. So X given M1 and, uh, sorry, so X prime given M1 and X prime given M2. Uh, which are operationally equivalent, namely that their statistics cannot be distinguished relative to any uh, preparation procedure, okay? And to apply the assumption of measurement on contextuality here, again, this is the direction of the assumption, is to say that the response functions for all ontic states are identical. That is, you uh, cannot at the ontological level distinguish these two measurement settings, okay? You cannot distinguish them at the operational level anyway. That's the prediction of the operational theory. But now you're trying to say something more. You're trying to say that even ontologically, there must be no distinction between them. So this is sort of inspired by, um, if you ask Rob Speckens, he'll or read his papers, he will tell you that it's sort of inspired by an idea of uh, a Leibnizian idea of like identity of indiscernibles. So if things are indiscernible at the operational level, they must be sort of identical at the ontological level. So it's sort of that sort of principle. Um, now the question is, uh, does this principle hold uh, in quantum theory in general? And it doesn't, like it fails. Um, uh, but before we get to all that, uh, let me just give you two examples that will be relevant uh, to, to this talk. So, so the first example is where um, Alice and Bob share some entangled state, okay? Um, and now we will look at the experiment. So the experiment is of the form where Alice is doing some measurements and Bob is doing some measurements. So it's just like in a Bell experiment, but uh, we want to view this experiment from the point of view of Bob's lab. So every time Alice uh, implements measurements on her part of the entangled state, she steers um, uh, Bob's system um, uh, according to like the different uh, Preparation. So the preparation procedures here correspond to the ensembles to which um, each measurement setting of Alice corresponds to, like on on, on Bob's uh, system. Okay. So this is this is that situation. So Alice doing some measurements, and each measurement setting induces a preparation setting on Bob's side. So it, it prepares an ensemble on Bob's side. Okay. Uh, now, of course, we know that because of no signaling here uh, between Alice and Bob. Um, if you coarse crane over the uh, probabilities for this X outcome, so now we call these preparation settings instead of preparation settings on Bob's side rather than measurement settings on Alice's side. So it's just like a relabeling of the original situation where we want to think of like the prepare and measure experiment that's going on on, on, on Bob's wing of the experiment. Um, so, so this is basically the no signaling condition. This, um, but here we want to view it as an operational equivalence. Like here, no signaling gives you an operational equivalence between two ways of preparing um, uh, the, the same reduced state on, on Bob's system, okay? And so that at the level of preparation non-contextuality, so when I apply this assumption of non-contextuality, that means that in my ontological model, when I write this uh, factorization of, of, of this thing in terms of the ontological model, then this distribution, should not depend on I because all the ensembles in Bob's side are operationally equivalent. They, when you coarse grain over the outcomes, they're all the reduced state of Bob. 
So which means that I should assign a unique distribution for all of these i's, right? So now if you look at the mathematical form of this, this should remind you of, of, of local causality. But again, I have to remind you that in this case, we, we, we want to view the experiment entirely from like Bob's um, uh, wing, okay? So, um, so, so this is an example, like it's not the only example of preparation on contextuality, it's the one that's like for the first time when you introduce it to someone, it's kind of maybe more natural to think of it this way. If you already know Bell, then you can see that uh, it's related to preparation on contextuality on Bob's side. And this will be relevant to the talk. Um, the second example is of measurement on contextuality. So this already appeared in the, in the um, pre-seminar a bit, but here, for example, you, uh, if you look at two POVMs, um, so are like abstractly two measurement settings, uh, MI, which have each has four possible outcomes. So these are the two possible um, measurement settings. Now it turns out that there's some operational equivalence, namely that for all preparation procedures, the statistics of outcome two for measurement M1 is identical, is indiscernible from uh, the statistics of outcome three of measurement M2, okay? So in the case of quantum theory, this obviously happens when, for example, this is like a POVM, this is like a POVM, and these POVM elements are equal, okay? But these, on the other hand, these two are distinct POVMs, okay? So that happens in quantum theory, obviously. Um, abstractly, this is what we mean by an operational equivalence that you know these two measurement procedures cannot be distinguished by any preparation. Um, and so that means that in your ontological model, these indiscernible measurement events will be identified, okay? So which means that I, I replace them by like this intersection of the two. This is how I get that hypergraph that I was talking about in the, uh, if you want to approach it from this perspective, it comes about because you observe these operational equivalences and then you want to identify these, these guys, okay? And, um, and so now it means that if I talk about probability assignments to this guy, they, so by measurement on contextuality, they have to be independent of the um, basis or the, the POVM that they come from, okay? And, um, and that's the assumption of measurement on contextuality here. So that's, that's like operational equivalence, operationally indistinguishable measurement events must be ontologically indistinguishable. Okay, so that finishes uh, the contextuality part. Now, um, in terms of uh, the one-shot, um, uh, classical communication problem. Again, you have this uh, situation, which I've sort of talked about already in the pre-seminar, but for those who weren't there, uh, it's the, the basic problem is that Alice and Bob share some classical channel. Uh, this has inputs X, outputs Y, um, and, um, uh, and yeah, so the situation is, note that the situation is time-like separated, so they're, they're signaling from Alice to Bob here. Um, and so, so yeah, so they, they want to communicate using this channel and they eventually they want to use some sort of entanglement assistance. But for now, let's like proceed stepwise. Uh, so firstly, I will consider, for example, some classical assistance with classical shared randomness. Um, but before we get to it, uh, I guess this is just like a quick primer on, 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 on the representation of the channels. So this is an example of a channel which has three input letters, A, B, and C, and two, output uh, letters one and two. And, um, and you can see that B and C are confusable in the sense uh, that like, you know, if I see output two, the input can, could have been B or, or C. So confusability set of an output Y is like the set of X that could output Y, right? Um, and when we talk about message encodings, we will refer to disjoint partitions of like the input symbols, okay? So this is an example of, uh, um, for example, a noiseless sort of uh, encoding, like in the sense that if you saw the um, outcome uh, one, like output one, then you know that the Alice wanted to send the message start. If you saw two, you know that Alice wanted to send the message stop. And this is a, a noisy example, like where uh, for one, you know that Alice wanted to send a uh, start, but for two, uh, you're confused, it's not, clear whether Alice wanted to send B or C, namely start or stop, okay? Um, so in the classical case, when they share like some classical shared randomness, in addition to this uh, channel, 
um, you can think of the, the success probability. So, so, so here, so consider the message encoding as given, like so you're given the message encoding. Um, then Alice chooses her measure, um, her uh, message with some prob prior probability P of M. Um, and for every um, message she wants to send, she'll assign some outcomes to the corresponding um, inputs uh, um, for the channel. Okay, so this is part of her strategy. And uh, she inputs um, this X with this probability to the classical channel. And then the classical channel records, uh, sends, reveals some output Y to Bob depending on the channel probabilities. Okay, now Bob's task is to use this Y and possibly some shared randomness um, uh, to infer what, mass, what message Alice wanted to send. So, so this is Bob's guess M prime. And the goal is to make M prime equal to M, right? So in the classical case, again, I just added this shared randomness thing here. Um, it doesn't really change anything because like the best classical um, uh, strategy will be like, you know, an extremal one. So, um, okay, so, so, so this is the case in, in, in the, the classical success probability. Um, now, if you go to the case of entanglement assistance where they share some entangled state, then you can view the protocol as Alice doing some POVNs uh, indexed uh, labeled by the message she wants to send, so M. And when she implements a uh, POVM MM, she observes some outcome X, which is what she's going to input to the channel. Okay. Uh, Bob, on the other hand, uh, will do some um, POVMs depending on the output he observes, like the Y. And um, uh, M prime will be uh, his his guess. Like, you know, this, this could be some complicated measurement that uh, includes like all kinds of classical post-processing and stuff. But uh, this is eventually Bob's guess for um, uh, Alice's uh, measurement setting in some sense, like the message that Alice wanted to send. Um, okay, so what happens in this setting? In this setting, uh, this is your general expression for the success probability. So again, the way to read it is that, you know, for every message that uh, Alice wants to send, she wants to send it with some probability. Um, uh, that means she's going to do some measurement M on her part of the entangled state, record the outcome X, which happens again with some probability. Then um, uh, she inputs it to the channel, uh, channel outputs Y with these channel probabilities. And uh, depending on Y, Alice is, uh, sorry, Bob is going to do some general uh, measurement. So this, like in quantum case, this is like a POVM, but you could think of like some, some general operational theories where, you know, this is some object in the operational theory. Um, and so, so here, this is, for example, the probability that uh, of Bob's guess M prime conditioned on everything causally prior to, to, to Bob's um, uh, receiving, uh, Bob, Bob's guessing this, this message M prime, okay? So including the measurement uh, setting on Bob's side and the, the setting and outcome on, on Alice's side, okay? So recall that this is like a communication sort of situation, Alice to Bob, so it's reasonable to condition on, on, on these things. In the classical case, you cannot because the classical randomness is, is, is uh, pre-shared. So there's no access to this guy in the sense that, so, you know, from the classical channel, you have access to just this output Y, but in the quantum situation, when you have this shared entangled state, you also have access to these uh, reduced states, like because Y gives you some information about X. So like, you know, you can, you can say something about like these guys. So which is why we are conditioning on these guys here, okay? So in, in the case of uh, quantum theory, the, the, this probability rule will be given by trace of the, you know, the POVM element on, on Bob's side and the reduced state, uh, sorry, the conditioned on, conditioned on Alice's outcome on, on, on Bob's side, okay? So that's this probability. Now, um, okay, so, so, so that was a summary of, of, of how the protocol for entanglement assisted classical communication looks like. Um, now the third thing, the third theme, so contextuality, um, 
the communication protocol. The third thing is non-local games. So now you can, now you remove, now consider a counterfactual situation, a different situation, different experiment where they do not have a classical channel anymore, but they do the same measurements that they do in the original protocol for the classical communication. And so, you know, there will be these bipartite distributions, X M prime given M and Y. Um, and you can talk about, you know, whether they satisfy or violate bell inequalities. So this is like the third sort of theme. Um, okay, so, so that was an introduction to sort of the, the, the three themes um, which uh, this paper is based on. Now I can move on to like how we put these themes together and to, to obtain some results, okay? So the first result is that um, the, it's the preparation contextuality on, on um, Bob's side, namely the fact that uh, you, um, so the thing is that we wanted to assume um, uh, preparation on contextuality, right? Like that we assign the same distribution to different ensembles that are prepared on, on Bob's side. So if you, if you make that assumption, then you can show that there is a bound on um, uh, uh, the success probability when Bob is holding systems which are which admit preparation on contextual sort of ontological models, and and that bound you can show turns out to be the same as the classical bound. So this this observation is not all that surprising once you kind of notice that you know the condition for preparation on contextuality looks um, essentially the same as the local causality condition. Okay. But the reason we emphasize preparation contextuality here is because this is not a non-local game. This is not a situation where the two parties are space-like separated. Okay, there is some communication going on. Um, so which is why uh, uh, I'm trying to say here that preparation contextuality drives the quantum advantage. Okay. Now, um, you can construct a, a correspondence between, um, um, so, so of course, like, so when I say preparation contextuality, I mean, you know, the success probability sort of exceeds this bound. So that means that um, that tells you that you cannot do justice to the statistics using a model where you assign the same distribution to different ensembles. Um, so the connection with non-local games, uh, as you may have anticipated, comes about because of that mathematical sort of connection between the two conditions of local causality and preparation on contextuality. And uh, you can show, so for example, in, in this original paper by Qubit and others, um, they showed that, you know, um, you can construct the ideal protocol where like, you know, you have zero error um, to a non-local game, which is basically a pseudo telepathy game. Uh, but the same construction generalizes to the case where um, you don't have a zero error protocol, you incur some error, but you're trying to sort of reduce the, the error uh, you incur by using shared entanglement, okay? And the rules of the game, if you notice, are such that, um, so again, uh, recall that this was the message in the original protocol that Alice wanted to send. This was the input to the channel. This was the output of the channel. And this was the um, uh, outcome of, of Bob uh, when he did some measurement depending on this output. Um, so, in, in this in this counterfactual situation with like the, the non-local game, we choose the rules of the game in such a way that they basically mimic the the success in the, in in the communication problem. So if if y um, so for example if Alice's outcome x um, uh, is is such that uh, you know uh, Bob's uh, measurement setting y is is not in the support of x in the channel. So the key here is that the non-local game depends on the channel hypergraph, okay? It, like, if you give me the channel hypergraph, I can define the non-local game. That's the key. And so success in the non-local game is associated with basically um, Bob uh, guessing um, uh, Alice's measurement setting, okay? For um, every time um, uh, Bob's... Uh, um, output Y, like the, the output Bob receives, is in the support of uh, the input Alice makes to the channel. Anyway, so, so the key here is that the channel hypergraph defines this non-local game. And, and the channel hypergraph also determines the success probability in the, in, in the communication game. 
And so it turns out that, uh, as I said, quantum advantage in the one-shot communication problem is uh, related to the quantum advantage in the corresponding non-local game. So for every communication problem where you have an advantage, there's a non-local game where there's an advantage. So, uh, so we show, for example, for a particular family of classical channels, like namely classical channels, which are, we just call them output uniform in the sense that for every uh, input, like all the outputs uh, corresponding to it um, appear with equal probability. Uh, so that's this. Um, so for these, we can show this kind of exact kind of relationship that every time uh, you have a success, um, uh, you beat the classical bound here, you beat like the local bound here. And in the particular case where you have zero error communication, which is the success probability of one, um, you have uh, the corresponding non-local game is a pseudo telepathy game, which are again built out of quotient Becker sets for those who may know about these. So pseudo telepathy games are basically ones where the quantum value is, is one, okay? Um, so an, an example of, of, of this one shot communication problem with, um, um, uh, where, for example, you cannot communicate with zero error, but you can hope to reduce the error, is this one where, um, so, so this was a follow-up to the, the Qubit paper. This is an experimental result, but on the theory side, they, they try to look at a simpler, uh, to, to look at a simple channel, much simpler than in the original Qubit paper. Um, and uh, so this is a completely connected sort of uh, situation. And the channel has like four inputs, it has six possible outputs. Um, and our framework basically applies to the, the, the protocol considered here. And you can, you can recover like everything about this protocol using the, the general framework I was talking about because, the, because in, in, in my description of the framework, I haven't really made a lot of assumptions about what kind of channel that, that we are talking about here. The, the qubit protocol itself um, so for those who were in the, in the pre-seminar, uh, you already saw this channel. So it's, it's this big uh, channel. It corresponds to um, Perez's uh, construction of like a 24 vector quotient specker set. Um, namely, like, you know, you can, you can think of uh, these guys as, uh, so, so here the solid lines indicate like the channel hypergraph, the dotted lines indicate like the, the message encoding that, that, that's optimal in this, in this protocol. Now, um, so you use this general framework that we've been talking about and we show that, um, so the first generalization is that we extend the, the original result to the case of uh, where your measurements are not projective, for example, these could be POVM, POV, POVM elements. Um, and like, you know, you don't share a maximum entangled state, maybe you share something more noisy. Um, uh, and uh, so relative to a fixed message encoding, we kind of uh, show like, you know, how, how you can witness an advantage in this uh, problem. So again, these, this is like rehashing like things I already mentioned. This is the protocol, it's the same protocol. The only thing that changes is like, you know, how this inference strategy works and like things like that. So um, in, this, in, in this more complicated channel with like uh, corresponding to a quotient specker set, um, we already know from our general sort of situation where we did not assume a lot of things about the channel that the, the, the bound from preparation non-contextuality is matches the classical bound. Now, if, if I was to make, if I were to make the assumption of measurement non-contextuality, that basically restricts the kind of um, uh, probability assignments Bob can make for his measurement outcomes. And so that means that, um, in general, this bound, when I add an assumption here, will be less than the classical bound. Now, um, the question is like, is this ever saturated? And in, in general, no, but if you look at a specific uh, family of, of, of like a restriction of the one-shot communication problem, where you uh, motivate this constraint that we'll call context independent guessing, um, and this condition uh, in, those, in, in those kinds of games, so here it's the classical success probability, but with the additional constraint that uh, your inference strategy for Bob's inference strategy satisfies this condition for context, context independent guessing. Okay, so, so this, this condition is motivated by saying that uh, assume a situation where 
uh, Bob doesn't trust the channel probabilities. He knows nothing about the channel probabilities. The only thing he can trust is the channel hypergraph. Okay, so he only knows the channel hypergraph, but he has no information about the channel probabilities. So, so, so that's the motivation for saying that his inference of, um, so in, 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 in this protocol, every time you guess an X prime, you know the corresponding M prime. So this is basically like, you know, that. Uh, you can replace this by M prime. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, like the, the M prime that contains this uh, X prime. Um, so, th so this is basically saying that, that this probability is, is um, it only depends on the support um, um, of, of, of this um, X prime, like, like the outputs that it can lead to, but not on the exact, um, um, yeah. So, uh, so, so this is, um, so, so yeah, so, so basically Bob's inference strategy cannot non-trivially use the channel probabilities because he doesn't know them. Okay, that's what I'm trying to say here. Um, so in this situation, you can show that the non-contextual bound agrees with the classical bound. So recall that we've modified the game now originally, the original communication problem. The constraint we've added is that Bob doesn't know the channel probabilities. Um, now uh, you can show that the, the success probability in this game is related to a witness for uh, contextuality, uh, which comes from a certain uh, hypergraph framework that's in this paper. Um, so, so this quantity here, maybe I won't go into explaining it in the interest of saving time, but this quantity will appear in the expression for the success probability, okay? And this quantity depends only on the on on you know the states and measurements Bob is holding. It doesn't depend on the channel. Okay, that's the key here. We relate this quantity, which depends on the contextuality of the system that Bob is uh, holding, to a channel property like the to success in the in the game. Like the success in the game is bounded by uh, 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 an invariant that's associated with the channel hypergraph. So if the channel hypergraph is gamma and your prior probability of the over the messages P of M, then you have this thing that we call a non-contextuality inequality. If you violate this, then you know that there's some contextuality going on. Now the question is, does that tell us anything about success in the game itself? And the claim is that it does. Um, so in particular, you can express the, the success probability in this, in this game with this context independent guessing constraint. Um, uh, you can lower and upper bound it depending on just this quantity, like the, the contextuality on, on Bob's um, uh, system, like his, his side, uh, and this quantity, which is a property of just the channel. So this, cha this, this is a property of like the Bob's quantum stuff, and this is a property of the classical channel. Okay, so you can you can bound this out lower and upper bounded uh, in terms of this thing. So. So this eta min, eta max, these are uh, what we call like the min max uh, confusability of input symbols. So they basically, they quantify like how confusable are any two input symbols in some sense for like the message encoding of interest. So this is like a detailed definition. But the key here is that, you know, this is like the quantum stuff. This is like the channel stuff, okay? And you can, you can lower and upper bound the success probability in this way. Now for the special case where this is true, now this happens to be the case for the channel that qubit and others considered. So in that case, um, in the contextual regime, namely when you witness contextuality on Bob's side, uh, that's one-to-one -one related to an advantage in the, non uh, in, in the communication problem, okay? So this provides an application of, of, of some noise robust sort of non-contextuality inequalities we had in this paper. Um, so, so that's sort of the connection between contextuality and the entanglement assisted thing. We all, I already to told about, the, I already mentioned the connection with non-local games. This is the second sort of connection. Um, okay, so I think now I'm at the end of my talk. Um, so um, yeah, so, so takeaway, essentially, um, I showed three main things. Uh, firstly, the role of preparation on contextuality in the, in, in, in the game, in the, in the general protocol, um, how it's related to non-local games, like generalizing the connection to pseudo telepathy games, um, to the case of games which are non uh, pseudo telepathy, strictly speaking. And uh, the third result was like an application of non-contextual inequalities that we had in a separate 
paper completely, uh, well, it's related to the quotient spectral theorem, but through that bridge of the quotient spectral theorem, we come to this sort of uh, connection to entanglement assisted uh, one shot communication problem. So these were the three results. Now, um, there's, there's many different things that you can ask about this work. Um, so for example, you can ask, um, you know, how would you go about constructing? So if I give you a one-shot communication protocol and I guarantee you that there's an advantage there, uh, how do you construct the corresponding non-local game? So recall that the non-local game that we constructed depended only on the channel hypergraph. It didn't depend on the channel probabilities. So for example, there's scope for constructing games, which I don't know, depend in some non-trivial way on the channel probabilities. Um, an interesting kind of consequence is that you can ask yourself about uh, advantage with qubit POVMs. So this may seem a bit uh, uh, counterintuitive, but you can realize this hypergraph. I mean, there's nothing stopping you. Let me just put it this way. There's nothing stopping you from realizing this hypergraph with POVMs, qubit POVMs, because you can have four outcome qubit POVMs and um, realize these kind of completeness relations. Um, but the question is, would such a thing uh, admit an advantage? So, so now you would, instead of like Alice and Bob each holding a four level system, they would hold qubit systems and they would do these POVMs. And the question is, can you still kind of um, improve the, the success probability of sending six messages? Maybe you can't, but I don't know the answer. Maybe there are uh, POVM strategies. So that's an interesting question here. And, and this question can be asked because our framework for uh, contextuality is applicable to POVMs. You can use it, you can make sense of POVMs, which you cannot do for the quotient spectral case. Now, um, the third question is like, you know, I looked at two concrete examples of the channels, like which already exist in the literature, the qubit example and the, the, the Prevedal, like the, the smaller channel. Um, both of those have this property that they're um, uncolorable in the quotient spectral sense, okay? But you could ask this for a more generic channel. You could ask, uh, you know, what about channels which are maybe colorable, like where you can assign these things, but maybe they admit state dependent proofs of contextuality. So this is KCBS, which is an example. Um, so in, in this case, you, you could ask, can I, can I do something like that for these channels? So the framework should be applicable to the, this, this picture. Um, a more speculative direction is like, you know, you, you could take a more causal perspective on this problem and say, okay, I, what I did was I simulated a direct cause resource, namely uh, an extra message being communicated from Alice to Bob using a sort of a common cause resource, namely the, the entangled state that they shared. And um, so there's something maybe to be explored there from the perspective of like, you know, causal relations, like how you convert a common cause um, resource into a direct cost kind of resource. So again, this is kind of vague, but uh, that's the general direction. And you can also take the channel simulation perspective, namely, you know, here we are, um, instead of trying to simulate noiseless channels, we are kind of, uh, it's just the generalization of that problem where you want to reduce the noise in a channel. Again, like I'm using some figure of merit, but maybe you can use some other figures of merit. And you could ask like in some resource theory perspective, like, you know, um, and in, in a resource theory of channel simulation, what's the sort of pre-order and how that's related to um, uh, the you know, advantage with contextuality and things like that. Okay, so I think I'm done with most of what I wanted to say and I'm happy to take questions.